Welcome back to another Weekly Market Insight. Joining me this week is Chris. Uh, John is actually out. He's out on vacation. Uh, he's not doing it as a business expense. He's in Sedona with, uh, with Judy. So, John, we miss you a lot. Uh, but, Chris, we're, we're happy to have you here. Thanks for having me. It's actually the first time John's left on vacation since I've been here. So, happy to fill in for him. Yes, hopefully he has more vacations coming up. Uh, I, I always enjoy these times with you, Chris. So, uh, one of the things that I think everyone is talking about, and certainly on our, our minds when we're thinking about the market, it, is the market in a bubble? Yeah, this is, this is the common one. You, you turn on TV and you, you often get an oversimplified definition. They say, price to earnings, PEs are high, sell your stocks. That's, I would say that that is the, uh, the, the, the statement that they're doing. And I think what it is in people's mind, because they are seeing those valuations, they are rich, uh, is 2000 and 2008. Uh, where if you would have sold in, during the, uh, the high valuations and you went to bonds, that would have been a good trade. Uh, but probably not so much a great trade. But I, I think that it's a fair statement to say valuations are stretched. What we're looking at here is a price-to-earnings ratio. You want to tell us a little bit about a price-to-earnings ratio? Kind of what, what's there whenever a stock or how they're valuing it for those that just hear P.E. ratio? Yeah, so you're taking this, this is the S&P 500, so the the price of the S&P 500 divided by its trailing earnings. Right. You can use, there's all sorts of measures for price to earnings. You can use trailing, you can use forward. Specifically, we're using a high measure here, which is trailing. Um, it's looking at the last 12 months of earnings and saying, how much are you paying per dollar of earnings? Right. So that's a way that you could value stock where you don't have to worry about inflation and just the fact that earnings are going to go up, so the value of stock should go up. So it's a way to keep that ratio and compare them over time. And if we look historically, any time we're around that 20 uh, it has been a time to be cautious at least. It's not 100% that you have the, uh, the market sell off and you can certainly have corrections while you're below uh, a 20 price to earnings. But I think that's a, a, a fair line and you can see 2008, uh, it was up to 120. Now there's some, some wiggle room here whenever you're looking at price to earnings on, on stocks uh, because of just earnings can go up and price can move on, on those. Um, but whenever you're looking at these valuations and you're saying, well, what's the alternative? The alternative in 2000 and 2008 were bonds. So if you would have sold in looking at uh, that 2000 time frame, the 10 year was paying over five and a half percent. Uh, and inflation was fairly low, especially during the recession, so you were getting real yields. There was a place to go. And even in 2008, uh, we had some inflation going up into 2008. That was causing the Fed to actually raise interest rates, so you were getting uh, 4.5 to 5% on a 10-year. Uh, well, that's completely different today. Uh, we don't have those higher yields in the bond market. We're at... Uh, at 1% and inflation expectation, or 174 on the 10 year right now, uh, and inflation expectations are running at 3.3. So not only is the interest rate low, but inflation is actually above what that interest rate is paying. Uh, and you had a chart that you put yeah. together that looks at it a different way. We just wanted to put, put numbers to the story, and, and that is we want to show, well, people think PEs are high, so let's show the highest one we can currently. That's 33 looking past 12 months, where we know there were some some rough time right, for earnings. So, so right, the second quarter of, uh, of 2020, earnings were pretty low. Right? We were in lockdown, so uh, you're, you're probably missing 25%, uh, maybe more of the earnings more. because it took several quarters to recover. Right, so you can see that number, of course, is elevated for that reason, and you see it is above historical average, which is somewhere around 16 to 19. Right. And that's just looking at the S&P, as we said, compared to what? Now, not often do people pull out a PE on a bond, but it has a price and it also has an earnings right. and the, the coupon yield. So you can pull PE on the T-bond, the which we did, the 10-year treasury, and you can see it's much more inflated than where the PEs are for equities. Yeah, just looking at this on a, on the, a, a simple uh, math, well, we're about two times the average uh, for stocks and three times the average on bonds. So they're a lot more overvalued uh, than stocks based on historical averages. And we also have the, the ability, of, if you have a coupon on a bond, there's only a handful of bonds, maybe uh, Treasury inflated protected securities where that coupon's gonna change. That E is never going up where you can get it in, in stocks. So the only way that you correct the PE ratio on a bond 
is have the price move back down, meaning right. the interest rate move up. That's not the case with stocks. Right. And that's not the case with what we're expecting this year. And when you look at forward PEs, but you're much lower in the low 20s, 22 roughly. And we're, we're entering earnings season. What are the expectations for earnings this quarter? They're ex extremely high. Extremely I don't, I don't, high. I don't have the numbers in front of me. No, but I would say that we're going to see uh, record breaking. Now, I want to put an asterisk on that record breaking because we're, once again, we're looking back 12 months ago whenever we're in just the, the worst part of the, uh, the lockdown where businesses are all shuttered and there's no earnings coming in. Uh, but the amount of stimulus that has been added to the economy and the growth, I think we're going to see earnings blowouts that are just going to be spectacular right. relative to historical and, norms. And the question that everyone's going to be talking about is what is priced into the market? How will it react to these upside beats? Uh, yes. Uh, I, I think a lot of analysts are, are fairly pessimistic whenever uh, the market's coming out of a correction. And then whenever we get in the euphoria, they're a little optimistic. So we're probably in between there. We haven't hit euphoria yet. Uh, but I would expect the P.E. ratios to actually look pretty good uh, once the earnings uh, is over. And then they'll probably bid them up expecting uh, growth like that again, which may or may not be the yeah. case. Uh, but if, if we can look at bonds with price to earnings ratios, another way we could do it where we're typically looking at bonds as an earnings yield, we can do the same thing with stocks. And we can do that historical. And there's actually a thing called the Fed model where you compare the earnings yield of stocks to the earnings yield of, uh, of bonds. And whenever one is over the other one, that's the one that is more undervalued and you invest. So if we go back to the 60s, you should have been buying stocks, not bonds, based on the earnings yield. Uh, and then we get all the way up to the 80s. And we can see that both lines actually go perfectly together. That's because of what you're, you were saying at the very beginning. You don't just have a stock market and a bond market. They both compete for investments. So if yields are going down in one, other people are going to buy the other, and that's going to help those yields go down. But we can see the red line, which is stocks, is actually over blue right now. Once again, not just the PE, but looking at the earnings yield, which we're really saying the same thing, we can see that no stocks are actually more attractive uh, versus bonds when we look at the overall investment opportunity set. Yeah, as you show that, as they're kind of diverging from each other, saying there's that alternative in bonds just, just isn't really attractive. Right. Uh, and uh, one thing is with bonds, people will often say, yeah, but Aaron, I'm going to get my money back. Uh, and barring a de default, and if you're in treasuries, that shouldn't happen. They can always print money to, to pay those things off. Um, th then you are going to earn your money. But that doesn't mean that you can get your money back tomorrow. And a lot of times clients are going to need to spend money out of their investment accounts maybe tomorrow. Uh, so what is the downside risk of bonds? Well, that's the interest rate risk. And we're at 174 on the 10-year. We've had one of the worst starts over the last 40 years over the last, uh, in the first quarter uh, for bonds. So they've already uh, uh, sold off. But just another 1%, and we would see another 7 to 9% uh, to loss in uh, the 10-year Treasury. So there's certainly some downside risk right. in bonds. What do you see that could cause that to jump to yields from 1.7 to 2.7 or the opposite going from 1.7 down to 70 uh, basis points? So what could cause interest rates to increase is just government spending continuing to increase because there's only so much uh, money that can be invested. Uh, and the way that they have been offsetting a big steep increase is they've been printing money, but then that can cause inflation expectations, which also can cause interest rates uh, to move up. And I think that's what we've seen this first quarter was inflation expectations of government spending causing that interest rate on the bonds, which was very low during the pandemic, to move back up uh, in, a, in a pretty steep fashion. And we don't know that it can't move up another 1%. Uh, and, and then what can move it down? Well, another lockdown uh, or some other crisis or black swan that would cause the market to sell off, which says, yeah, I know that long-term bonds are not a good position, but the stock market's going to sell off more than bonds. We're not saying that you can't lose money in, in, in the right. stock market, especially short term, or at least value, so people would have that flight to quality going back to the bonds in that, uh, that short period of time, and you'd see prices move up. Uh, so w even though we favor equities over fixed income, don't hear us say you should abandon fixed income. Uh, but ultimately, I think the risk for fixed income is the, the long-term risk of inflation, uh, especially at low interest rates. Because once again, if, if interest rates increase and you see the drop in the, your treasury, 
you know over time it's just going to appreciate and get you back all the cash that you were expected. There's never going to be any more upside to the bond than whatever you, uh, from what you bought. Uh, so you'll always get those guaranteed cash flows uh, minus a few other exotic bonds that are a little bit different. But for the most part, plain vanilla bond, you're going to get your cash flow back. So if we had a thousand dollar bond, and it's gonna pay us 1%, and we're gonna hold it for 20 years, you're gonna get about $1,200 at the end of it. Uh, and that's to be expected. $1,200 is certainly more than 1,000. But what is about that purchasing power of that, that $1,200? Uh, it took 12, 20 years to get it. Well, what if we compare, if we go to the right, a cost of basket, we're gonna assume the basket today costs $100, and we're gonna inflate it by 2%, 4%, and 6%. So the bond appreciated 20%, but at a 2% inflation, that $100 basket of goods now cost you $150. There's a 50% increase in your basket uh, at 2% inflation, and you only had a 20% increase on your bond. Now at four, it's more than double, at over $200. Now it's 20 years, uh, so it does take, uh, it is a lot, a uh, long time. And at 6%, which would be Unusual to see 6% inflation over a 20-year time period. Uh, that would be over $300. Uh, so another way to think about this is just to compare the bonds to the, the cost of goods, and that's this lower left hand. But the simple way is just saying, what is the effect of my purchasing power on that basket of goods, assuming that I've invested and I'm earning 1% and I'm losing 2 4 or 6%. So in the 2%, you're losing 1% uh, to inflation each year. At 4%, you're losing 3%, which has historically been the, the expected and norm uh, for inflation, and then that 6%. Well, at the uh, day one, no matter what the inflation is in the future, the $1,000 can buy you 10, uh, or 10 baskets. Uh, but if we go out 20 years, at 2%, you can only buy eight baskets. So you've lost 20% of your purchasing power. If you could store it, it would have been better to buy the 10 baskets of goods and put them in uh, your pantry and just leave them there and not buy the bond whatsoever. Uh, at 4%, so you're losing 3% of value, uh, you're down to less than six baskets. And if it was at uh, uh, 6%, less than half, so you're, you're below four baskets that you're able to purchase. Now, people may push back and say, Aaron, 5%? over 20 years, and I think that's fair, but I'm only talking about the loss in inflation. That income that you're gonna get on the bonds, that's gonna be taxed. And typically you buy bonds uh, in a fund of some, that you have some investment management fees. So I think if you throw in inflation, you can throw the taxes, and you can throw in investment management, it, it's not uh, beyond the realm of possibility to be somewhere between that five and three percent, especially since three percent has been the historical norm on loss of purchasing power. Now we have a mission to help clients become and remain financially self-reliant and bonds are not going to fill that role. Other than that short-term need in portfolios to ballast in case we do have a correction, which is always possible, we don't see bonds playing a role of preserving uh, purchasing power and wealth. We just kind of have it as something that is going to not go down as much if we have equity sell-offs. And that's one of the reasons yep. that we like and advocate holding cash uh, in the cash hubs. And during uh, last year, we actually raised all the way up to 36 months after the portfolios had recovered. And we've been spending that down because I think we're far more optimistic about the market than let's say we were in July or August of last year. We got better data. It looks like this recovery is real and it's got some legs to it. Right. So, so who's buying these bonds then? The Treasury's coming out with three hundred billion more in new issuance in the well, next coming weeks. I think the price, uh, or the biggest price setter in the market, would be the Federal Reserve. They're coming out and they say they're going to keep interest rates low, and they're actually buying uh, a certain amount at least. 80 billion a month. 80 billion, at least. At least. Month. They don't, they don't want to tie don't. themselves in a corner right. and not be able to buy more <laughs> if they want to. So I think that's one, uh, one big uh, institutional player that can buy as many as they want, and they don't care about the price at all. Right. 
Uh, they actually are hoping for inflation because that's the point of them doing it uh, to inflate away some of this debt. Uh, another uh, big buyer would be institutional investors. Let's say we are a life insurance company and we have a certain amount of life insurance policies that we know are going to pay out. Uh, and let's say it's a, a million dollar death benefit. Me as the insurance company, I actually hope that inflation comes up because the death benefit is only going to be smaller and smaller as inflation makes that fixed price go down as well. So I don't care what inflation is going to be. All I'm trying to do is say, I have this liability of this death benefit. Law of large numbers makes that fairly certain. And I'm going to take these assets and I'm going to set them aside and I'm going to have a guaranteed payment that equals that liability. So I'm going to match my asset to liability and I don't care what the yield is. Uh, so I think those are the biggest players, are the institutional players, both the Fed uh, and uh, whether it's pensions or um, insurance companies that are going to be buying it. But there is one uh, uh, area that has actually lost some. Uh, uh, they're, they're not buying treasuries the way that they were, and that's the foreign powers, but that's not 100%. Uh, one example would be Japan. You want to talk right. a little bit about yeah, Japan? Just the idea behind those, they, they have the currency issue. So if a Japanese investor wants to buy U.S. Treasuries, they have to go from yen to dollars back to yen. So they actually have the, the potential of getting currency gains. Mm -hmm. So they could get a potentially 1% currency gain on the dollar and a 1.7 on their yield, and that's a little bit higher than 2.7 on their domestic currency return for their foreign bond. Right. And whenever they're looking at a 1.7, uh, that's actually multiples higher than what they can get on their own uh, local bonds. So there are some foreign uh, countries that would also uh, continue to invest. It has gone down, though, over the last, uh, with the amount of monetary policy that kind of brings the uh, the purchasing power of the dollar in question. We've seen right. a lot less uh, purchases by foreign governments than we did, let's say, five years ago. Uh, so. In these calls, we've talked about inflation risk is high. Uh, John and I went over that last week. And now we've talked about favoring equities over fixed income. And I want to reiterate, we, we are not saying abandoning fixed income at all. We're, we're right. saying high cash balance, uh, overweight or favor equities to try to make up for the, uh, the lack of uh, inflation or interest that you're earning on, on bonds and cash. Uh, cash isn't paying anything either. Uh, so once again, you need to have some position in bonds just for the uh, the what will eventually be a market correction, whether that's next month or 12 months from now, those are going to provide uh, support. Can you give us some characteristics about bonds that we have been par uh, purchasing? Right. So, so the bonds on our portfolio are much shorter on the yield curve, meaning they have less of that interest rate risk that right. you mentioned with the 10-year treasury. So those, pr those movements in interest rates are not going to have as violent of price um, movements on our bonds. And I would say the fixed income that we have been purchasing, are, not only do, are we trying to take out that interest rate, we are moving up the quality, uh, and that's actually helped. So our fixed income portfolios have benefited from being more cash-like in instruments uh, because we haven't sold off as much as the, the overall uh, benchmark. Uh, we've, we also have favor U.S. equity. And now uh, we did a poll a few weeks ago saying, should, do you want to hear automation uh, or do you want to hear the, the bear case for China? Uh, and uh, we, we still want to get to that bear case in China. And one of the reasons that we favor U.S. is because the bear case that is in uh, China and other uh, developed countries as well uh, on why we favor U.S. domestic markets. So those that really were interested and voted for that know that we're going to cover that uh, in here. Uh, and do we favor technology, Chris? Yeah, I think we do a little yeah, bit. I think we've done a lot. Of, uh, uh, and, you know, we're making the case <laughs> for inflation, and we think that the Federal Reserve and the U.S. government will get that because they have a printing press. They can continue until they get the inflation. Uh, but there are certainly deflationary trends and really a lot of excitement that's happening in the, uh, uh, the world of technology. We still think long term that is the growth story uh, in the market, though those multiples are, are certainly higher than, let's say, uh, financials. And we've had financials helping uh, balance some of this uh, value rotation that we've exper experienced in the first quarter. Bearish on real estate and international. International, similar to the bearish story in China, uh, which we'll touch base on. Uh, and then, uh, would you say that we're as bearish on real estate whenever we put this theme together? 
probably a little bit more neutral. Yeah, and I would we can say, talk I would about that, that when we show the technicals. Absolutely, at the end. absolutely. And then we continue to see this move away from large cities, San Francisco, New York, uh, places that have been picking it up is Florida, uh, Tennessee, and, and, and Texas, and and that seems to be playing out. But it's not just leaving. New York City to go to these other states. We've seen that also just leaving New York City to go to the suburbs. Uh, so all of that is, is playing out uh, and uh, we, uh, we're we very happy with these investment themes and the progression. L like you said, other than real estate, I, I'd say we, were, were, we would make these same comments. We're a little neutral on real estate at the moment. Um, market continues to hit new highs. Even the NASDAQ, yeah. uh, the Qs. Good to see the NASDAQ coming back. Technology's really performed well over the last two weeks. Yes. Uh, so we continue to climb that wall of worry as the market continues to grind higher and higher. Now, it doesn't mean that there's no risk. Uh, you, you always want to sell when the market's high. You just don't know if it's going higher. Uh, so w we think it is going higher. Uh, but if we were to get a sell-off, we would see the support at 50-day uh, moving average, which is a steep sell-off. We'd be down to 39.20 on the S&P 500. And, and if that was to break, uh, for whatever reason that was causing this market dislocation, uh, we would have a hard bottom probably at that 200-day uh, to some of the other resistance. So there, there's some significant buyers at around that 3,600 uh, mark. And if we were to see similar data that we see now, uh, we would be a big buyer if that was to happen. Right. Uh, we would continue to overweight uh, equities, uh, probably similar to what we did in March when we made that V call in mm -hmm. the economy. If we saw a drop, uh, we know that the Fed is going to uh, uh, push uh, more stimulus, so will the, uh, the, the government. Uh, but the, there, there's a lot of things that are positive that are starting to gain traction that we think are real in the right. economy. Do you see any catalyst for a potential correction? The, the big one in the news is always tax increases, and the market seems to shrug it off every time that they've they've been announced. And, and I think the reason is is because in that bill that holds the the taxes, there's also a big spending. Uh, so really, they neutralize themselves. Now, what I'm not saying is that it doesn't matter as long as the government spends, they can tax as much as they want. There is a quality component in the uh, the growth of the economy. What is getting invested in, uh, and there can be investments made by the government, let's say roads that are, are very much needed and help the economy grow. But it tends to be that the private economy uh, does a much better job of allocating resources for uh, future uh, demand. But they're working solely off cooperation, so they're are investing on only what people uh, want, where the government is not necessarily uh, operating out of that paradigm. So I'm not saying that you can just tax and spend as much as you want and have uh, no impact, but that means the taxes are tied to spending. So I don't see that as the, the, the big deal. What I actually think uh, what would cause a correction is if that stimulus bill was to re be removed. So the government's going into austerity uh, and the money printing, which really has given us a sugar high over the last uh, year in the equity markets. I think that would be the more uh, likely case of seeing a, a, a pullback in the market. Uh, and that could be short-term pain, but that might be a nice restructuring for the economy long-term. That could be good. So it's not, th there, there's no low, low resolution answer on these. There's pros and cons and trade-offs uh, for both. So when we're looking at the, uh, the technical indicators, we are starting to actually see some of this uh, show up in our technical indicators. You want right. to talk about it? Yeah, so the S&P has moved up a little bit, but we've also seen over the past two weeks that NASDAQ 100, which is an overweight to mega cap, it's, it's definitely gaining some ground. Yes. And we've actually seen the pure play on the mega caps, which is the FANG index, is up 16% over the last 12 trading days. Right, so that's fa Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, uh, Google. And then they put a plus because they want to include Microsoft. <laughs> plus Microsoft. <laughs> I yeah. guess they, they can't get it. FANG M <laughs> yeah. in there. Um, so yeah, those have, uh, as much as the technology sector has struggled year to date, those stocks have not. Uh, they're up 12, 16 percent. Uh, I think on, is it on average or are they all above 12? Like it, there's one that's a lagger, isn't there? Yeah, there's, I, I, I don't know off the top of my head. I, I think Apple's struggling a little yeah, bit. I think Apple is struggling a little bit. I know that there it's is a It's not in our portfolio, so I don't uh, follow that one directly. <laughs> the ones in our portfolio yeah. have been doing well in the wide moat. Uh, and then we see small cap and value go down. Another one that's an oddity that we see a lot of news coverage on is gold is way down there in the bottom. While inflation expectations are high and uh, we have government spending up, and a lot of people are saying, well, that's because the flow is going to Bitcoin. 
Uh, and I think I think there's some be. truth to that. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't I don't think that's uh, completely unfounded, but I also think it's uh, a, a too simple of an explanation. Uh, one thing is Bitcoin has no use value other than uh, as uh, uh, something that people are trading as a, an alternative currency, and there is use in having an alternative currency. Don't don't hear me say that it's worthless, but gold does have alternative uses. One of them is jewelry, and the, the demand for gold as jewelry certainly dropped through uh, the last year because of uh, the lockdowns and people not doing uh, as, as much. Uh, so there is another component that is probably also a contributing right. factor uh, for gold not doing uh, well here. Um, another thing, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I think it's important that this is why we use our technicals for risk management. Yes. Because you could be sitting there holding gold, which is the worst performer on, on the chart here. But a really good bull case. Thinking that the bull case thesis is there, and as Tao reminds us every week, that younger generation just won't buy gold. They want to buy Bitcoin. Right. Uh, so how it plays out, we'll see. Maybe it's we got to rethink uh, inflation hedges. It's happened uh, historically before. Silver used to be money. Uh, people don't, they will buy it, but it has more technological uh, components to it really than the use of a, a monetary phenomenon now. So maybe we're uh, living in a different world, but I also do think that there's more to it than just Bitcoin is stealing all the flow right. uh, for gold. Uh, and we can see that if you go to your local coin dealer, there's actually a, a significant premium in buying those coins uh, versus what it is trading at the spot price. So there are people that are using these low prices in gold to continue to, uh, to take that supply off of market. Uh, and at, at some point, uh, if that continues on, you will see the, the price appreciation uh, of gold. But uh, we're definitely living in, in interesting times, I would say. Uh, you know, one of the other things is, so we have the, the how the technicals are avoiding us purchasing something that's that we we like right. uh, in, in our own uh, bull case, but the technicals are saying not to purchase, so we avoid the value trap. On the flip side, right. we're kind of bearish on real estate. We're looking at the lockdown and the change of behavior, the work from home policies. Cap rates, what you're getting on net operating income over the values as the values have increased so high. But it pushes back into real estate. Right, real estate's way. above S&P 500. Mm -hmm. So well, that's why we're in that neutral position. So just as much as we can make the bullish case for gold, but the market is not agreeing, we can make the bearish case for real estate and the market isn't being. So that those technicals help uh, avoid making a, a mistake because we don't know everything, right. uh, and uh, we don't have the hubris to, to think we do, so we definitely rely on the technicals to help us out on what we don't know. All right, well, we appreciate your time, and uh, if you uh, know of anybody that would uh, benefit from these calls, please click the arrow below and share and, and send that out, and uh, if you haven't done so, also, while you're down there, subscribe so that uh, you will be able to tune in, whether it's the weekly market insight where we take a deep dive to give you actionable advice so you can make informed decisions, or to get the skinny on the 3x3 three three where Chris and I both will get back and forth on, on what's happening and what's moving the market that day.